Okay. Now, what can do that? This is explosives. And uh, so now we switch to chemistry. And uh, if you want to blow up a concrete building, old time dynamite is, is very efficient. It was, as you know, invented by Alfred Nobel in 1666. And a lot of money has been earned on, that, earned on that invention ever since. But if you want to hit steel, you really need something more, I would say, modern. And the chemists have come up with a whole range of different explosives. One of them being the most efficient uh, called, is called RDX. You see the, the structure here, and I can elaborate on the structure. It's called cyclotrimethylene trinitamine. And if you're interested, I can explain why it's particularly violent, because the, uh, the combustion zone moves about 22, 23 times the speed of sound. So it breaks through the sound barrier the same number of times, and it is really something which hurts the ears. It is very noisy. But it's cheap, and it's very efficient. It is applied in what the American call beam cutters. And here you see two demolition workers mounting these so-called beam cutters around a beam at, a, at an angle of 45 degrees. And the purpose obviously being, you know, you know an explosive is, is a chemical substance where you have an evolution of gas very fast. So you have a pressure impact. You knock things over like that. Bang. And what happens here obviously is that, that these two beam cutters should cut the beam at this angle for it to shift over and go down. And if they have four beams side by side, they, they, they take them out at the, at the same time. So actually the whole structure moves out before it goes down. And then somebody has found it noteworthy that at ground zero after the collapse of the towers appeared some steel beams which had been cut uh, for some reason at exactly the same angle. And uh, there much more can be said about this picture. Uh, we don't have time for that. I'll just point your attention to this circumstance. Uh, instead of, now we are leaving the subject of explosions because I just mentioned that there are other means of cutting steel by pointing your attention to another phenomenon which happened uh, prior to the collapse of the South Tower. This is something which was pouring out of the corner. This is the corner opposite of the impact of the airline. And something is, is running out here, obviously some, some liquid material and it is dark red, orange, yellow. Uh, it is a molten metal. It's a liquid metal pouring out here. Just above actually two floors below the impact point of the airliner. This is another video recording of the same phenomenon and there is no soundtrack on this so I can talk about it. I can talk over it. This is uh, the observation which we have to consider now. And NIST is making a note of this in their report, and they're saying that this had, that what, what was running down the side of the South Tower here had an orange glow, as you have seen yourself. And this is very important, because it means that this is not aluminum. Aluminum melts uh, around 660 degrees centigrade, and of course the different alloys melt in the same range. And this is a temperature which you can achieve in an office fire if you feed the fire with sufficient oxygen, if you open the windows. You can, you can go to 600, 700, eventually 900 degrees if you really let the air come in. So you could melt aluminum, but molten aluminum is silvery white, like silver. It is not yellow. And uh, this is not copper, I promise you and it, neither is it gold. So the only metal which can account for this observation is iron. And uh, not, then we run into this, the problem that iron melts at 1538 degrees centigrade. And this is beyond the reach of any ordinary office fires. 
and just mention down there in the corner is a wonderful stone. And it doesn't melt, does it? You, and you, you haven't seen a stove melting. You haven't seen a pan making when you're making meatballs over the gas stove. So iron doesn't melt under ordinary circumstances. So how come that we see molten iron pouring out of the South Tower here? There is only one chemical reaction which can account for this observation, and it is called thermite. Thermite was, in, was discovered by a German chemist called Hans Goldschmidt, published in 1893. And his finding was that if you take aluminum uh, and very finely divide it as a powder, and you take iron oxide, I don't have to use the more common name as rust. Rust is a form of iron oxide. There are many other forms of iron oxide. So let allow me to use the correct term iron oxide here. So you make a mixture of these two powders. Now, if you can make them react, which is not so easy, you have to kick them. Uh, but uh, and if you have taken the course of inorganic synthesis, maybe you have made a thermite reaction. There's a whole range of thermite reactions. This is a standard thermite reaction with aluminum and iron oxide. It is very, it reacts very violently once it started. The heat development is tremendous, and the enthalpy change is 153 kilojoules per mole. Some of you may appreciate that number. For the rest of us, we notice that the temperature of the elemental iron formed in the process, this is a reduction, as you'll notice, those of you who's, who were there present in the chemistry classes, this is a reduction of iron from the oxidation state of three until it is zero. You form elemental iron in the process. This comes out at a temperature of 2,500 degrees centigrade, which is very, very hot. It's almost 1,000 degrees above the melting point of iron. So thermite is a very useful reaction because it can be used for welding. Goldschmidt patented the, this application already in 1898, and it was used for the first time in 1899 for welding tram rails in the city of Essen, in the rural area. And it has been used many, many times for welding frame rates. I have given this presentation for the senior club of, 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 the, of the Metal Workers Union, and the old blacks, they're saying, ah, we remember thermite welding. Yeah, we're doing that all the time. So this is what you do when you, when you, if you're understanding of the American prairie, and you had to lay down 5,000 kilometers of iron rails, uh, you um, you um, you do not have a, a, a what you call it, a torch. You do not bring a torch along. You make a little thermite charge between, and then you just have to to uh, to smoothen the surface afterwards. But because the iron coming out is so hot, it can also be used for destruction. So it has had military applications ever since its, its invention. In particular, in between the two world wars, they developed this technology you, using thermites in torpedoes and grenadoes for going through armor. This is what it's used for. But old time, because, because Goldschmidt's old time thermite is not an explosive. It is an incendiary. So thermite, grenades, torpedoes, they act by means of heat. They do not knock themselves through, say, a vessel, a ship. They burn their way through the ship. They melt the iron. And so now what, what thermite can do, I will, I will show you here by, by sacrificing a French car and at the same time give you an impression how we teach chemistry at the university. This is thermite. It's a powdered mixture of iron oxide and aluminium, which when ignited burns at two and a half thousand degrees Celsius, which is very, very hot. This is calm. It's been specially chosen to be destroyed because it's old, it's white, but more importantly, because it's French. The engine block is the densest part of a car. It's basically a huge lump of metal, and, well, it's very hard to melt. Lucky then, the Brainiacs have plenty of thermite. 
specially packed into the slow release mechanism of a garden flower pot. A big pile on the bonnet directly over the engine block should do the trick. Time to light the fuse and give this homage to French engineering the send-off it so richly deserves. The irreversible thermite reaction begins. Now you should see what happens under the car while going on down here. Within seconds, the fiery concoction eats through the bonnet, spraying molten thermite into the engine beneath. The devastation continues inside until finally a torrent of white hot liquid metal pours out of the bottom, signaling the inevitable victory for thermite. A quick check confirms a clear path of destruction through the engine. I showed this video for an English audience this Saturday in London, and they thought that the sacrifice of the French car was outrageously funny. <laughs> I've also shown it for the French-speaking audience, and they didn't find it funny at all, <laughs> as you might appreciate. Now, but maybe some of you have already have anticipated the problem here. If, they were, if Nils is telling us that thermite was used for taking down the towers, we have the obvious problem that what happened to the fewer poor French car with a flower pot on top of it was that the molten iron you goes down vertically, down, down through the molten block. How can you possibly destroy a vertical steel column by applying thermite? I can tell you that this problem has been solved many times. You can already you can imagine if you can use this in torpedoes. All what you have to do actually is to confine the thermite charge in a container and, and allow it to come out and it will find its way out also horizontally. Let me show you an advertisement actually for a device which you can which you can buy on the web and which is uh, what you should do if you want to burn down the house while you are, wh while you are on vacation on the Canaries or whatever, if you have that need. Um, and, but it's very short, so I have to, to tell you what you're going to see. You're going to see this device being mounted horizontally, and in front of it there'll be, if it's a steel beam or an iron beam, I don't know you'll see two wires coming out from the device because it is started ele electronically, which means that you can trigger it by a cell phone or whatever. And uh, yeah, then you'll see what happens to the steel beam. That's it. <laughs> so uh, that's how you do it. There's this can obviously be done. Now, there are many observations which support the anticipation of thermite, which has been re being applied also for the destruction of World Trade Center. One is the many reports of molten iron in the rubble. I have many witnesses, I have counted 23 of them, were telling that during the cleanup operation, uh, they experienced again and again when they were pulling out, say, a steel beam from the rubble, that it was glowing white in the end, and eventually it was dripping from the end of it. And there were pools and streams of molten iron. This picture was taken eight weeks after 9-11, so when the, uh, the grab goes down in the rubble and comes out, you have liquid metal actually dropping here. This picture is also taken at some time during the cleanup operation, and you expose these pools of molten iron. Something was really happening in the rubble. And this is a thermite reaction from the laboratory, which I just put in to make sure that you get the proper associations here. This picture, I don't know when it was taken. It must be pretty late, actually, in the cleanup, because you can see they have a, Removes, but there's something happening in here, in, in here which uh, in, almost resembles the black furnaces, which was in my geography book when I was attending elementary school in the 50s. Another thing which also points in the same direction comes from 
from another respected academic or scientific institution in the United States, namely NASA. They took an, an, an aeroplane and, uh, and flew over ground zero with an infrared sensitive camera, which was capable of measuring, determining the temperature in the very surface, actually not here, but on the surface, the surface temperature. So what you see here is not a geographical map, it's a thermal map of ground zero. And it's taken on September the 16th. So here, and the color code corresponding to, this is, this is one, this is two, this is seven up here. And the color code here corresponds to a surface temperature of 750 degrees centigrade. Come on. And up here it is 730 degrees centigrade. This is a surface temperature, and it is even beyond what you can obtain in an ordinary office fire. And it is after the collapse of everything. And in the, in, in the days in between, this is from September 16th, and in the days in between it had been raining. In particularly on, on the 14th of September, it was raining cats and dogs, it was pouring down. And still, you can obtain, you can observe, this is a measurement, a official measurement of 730 and 750 degrees centigrade. A week later, it had cooled off, but, as, but you'll see that uh, it actually took three months to put out these fires. Something was happening in the rubble. But regarding the molten iron, there were many witnesses. It has never seen before or after fires. Of course not. I mean, if, if you have if you have a farmhouse which is being burned out in, in the country, you don't find molten iron in the rubble. You never reach temperatures that hot. And it is not mentioned in any of the official reports. NIST flatly denies this observation because they know what it implies. They don't like it at all. I call what happened on Ground Zero, I call the longest smoking gun in history because it took three months to put out these fires. Something was happening there. And I do not claim that we understand all of it. Actually, there are some observations of the emissions of chemicals in the air, which, is still not unex which are still unexplained. But officially, the fires were put out, out on December the 20th. And did they try? Yes, they did. They poured millions of gallons of water on the stuff. And Hudson River was close by. They applied a synthetic. A fire depressant called Pyrocool. They just couldn't put a lid on these fires. Another evidence of thermite is the observation of microspheres uh, of iron in the dust. And I'll tell you what that is. There was a plenty of dust. In total, we're talking about 1.5 million tons of dust being produced, the collapse of the three of the three high rises. And um, out of, yes, you can divide, you can make an estimate how much came out of the towers and how much came out of seven. We see here these enormous volumes of dust and, and they lay all over. Very early there came out reports from two bodies. This is a private company called RJ Lee Group. In December 2003, they came out with a report where they actually were mapping, describing the content of the World Trade Center dust, and they reported what I'll show you in a little while on the occurrence of iron spheres in the dust. Same came out for the United States Geological Survey in 2005. I should put this one on. And due to this, and what you do is when you examine the dust, I have brought actually two samples of World Trade Center dust for your entertainment. And uh, you'll get an opportunity, all of you, actually to get a hand of this. Because what you do is you, uh, you apply a magnet. And uh, I have obtained actually the magnets I have here, I have got from a colleague of mine called Morton Bomassen. You know him? Yeah. yeah. He is in the Mars group. He's at the Rockefeller Institute. How many of you are studying physics? Okay. Yeah, so you know Morton. And you know he's, you know he's sending magnets to Mars to collect the, the red dust in the Mars atmosphere. And I have got, uh, maybe I should go over here. And I have obtained from him some of the, uh, some of the they're, they're very small, but they're very strong. 
It's an alloy made of iron, boron, and neodymium. This is about the strongest magnetic for permanent magnets you can get. Now I should take care where I put this. You should not put it next if you're carrying a pacemaker. You should not. You should, you should keep it. I, well, maybe I shouldn't put it there. I don't, but uh, still, you should be careful because if well, you can still get them off. And here I have two bags of World Trade Center dust. Not very big, but well, I'll pass them around in a little while. I'll show you what you have to do uh, if you want to do this experiment. Uh, you should, uh, and maybe, maybe the light is too dim actually for this, but uh, we, can, we can stick around and you can play along with it. So what you do is you apply the magnet to the dust and uh, you, you, you pull it around and you, and you, and you, ah, uh, oh, this is very hard, the light is too, yeah, I had some luck here. Because out of the dust, you can pull a dark, you should really, you should get to a very strong lamp to, uh, to see that. But you can pull, you can pull out a magnetic fraction of the dust. You'll realize that some of the dust contains magnetic material. And with some skill, if you play along a little bit, the magnet is outside the bag, obviously. So I'm pulling, I'm pulling the magnetic material out of the bag. And if you, if you practice a little bit, you can, you can see around the rim of the magnet, you can collect some dark, pulverized, very finely divided material. This is magnetic extraction from the dust. Maybe it's to no avail if I give it out now because the light is too dim. But if you just want to get your hand on World Trade Center dust, and there are human remains in here. We don't know. <laughs> so don't open the, please, two things. Don't open the bag and give it back to me. Yeah. And the magnets as well. You can pay, you, if you want to play, but otherwise you can. Uh, we can practice with it afterwards, and, and maybe find a good lamp uh, if uh, if you want to play along with this. Uh, everybody should get a chance. I'm not leaving before you're all happy with this. What did I do to the other magnet? Gosh, is he? Okay, but the point is, the point is that. Uh, if you make a magnetic extraction from, from the dust, what you get out is, uh, here are some typical uh, particles which you find in, in the magnetic extraction. And we should point our attention to two of these. First of all, please observe that some of these particles up here are completely spherical. And this is, uh, here is a close-up of World Trade Center dust. This is an electron microscope picture. There are no colors here. This is the dust. And some of the particles, not, this is before extraction. This is the World Trade Center dust. Actually, this is, a, I don't know, the samples I have at the Institute, there's a lot, many uh, threads and a lot of asbestos also. So this is not my sample. But some of the particles here are completely round, and this is a close-up of one of these particles. And uh, you'll recognize that it, when it comes out with the magnet, it's because it contains iron and aluminum as well, because the origin of it will become obvious in a little while. Uh, but how come the, the, the shape of it, how come that an iron particle is completely spherical? This implies that the iron has been molten and it has been up flying because this is a property of droplets, of a liquid droplet, that when, uh, because liquid has what we call surface tension. So when you have sufficiently small droplets, they become completely round. If you take a close up picture of, of, of water droplets in, in a fog, you'll appreciate that they're completely round as long as they are uh, what you call swaying, they're flying around. Also, the fat droplets in your skin milk completely round. It's a, basically the same phenomenon. So this is an, an unambiguous 
sign that this ion has been up and flying. So it, it may come from, from a thermite reaction. And what you do, and this is an American scientist called Stephen E. Jones, who's a brilliant scientist. And he's a brilliant experimentalist. And please, those of you working in natural science, rely on experiments. I can tell you a story about theoreticians in a little while, colleagues of mine. Pierre Hidegaard, if you know him, he's a theoretician. He has a different point of view because he does not respect experiments. Okay, but Stephen E. Jones, this American professor, he didn't experiment. He made a thermite reaction in the corner of his lab, which you see here. Same thing as on the French car. And the white cloud up here is the other product of the thermite reaction. This is aluminum oxide. And it is sputtering and burning exactly on, like on the French car. So, and afterwards, then you collect the, uh, the ashes and you take a look at it. And this is the ashes from a commercial thermite. You can buy the mixture. What the brainiacs had in, in, in their bucket uh, was a commercial product. You can buy that on eBay and you can play around with it in your garden. It is not recommendable. I promise you at least take on binoculars and spectacles. Protect it. But, um, but this is from the commercial thermite. And where you observe exactly the same ion spheres, uh, we saw the picture here before from, from the dust. But of course, this is not very scientific. So what we use is, is, a, is, a, is a technology called energy dispersive spectroscopy. One, what we do is that we point a beam of electrons on a specific spot. And this we can do with an accuracy better than one ten thousandth of a millimeter, 100 nanometers, 50 nanometers, eventually. We can, we can locate a specific point here with an electron beam. And the material responds by sending out x-rays. And this you can analyze in a spectrum down here. And each line in the emitted x-rays represent a specific element by virtue of its frequency. So this is kind of a fingerprint, actually, of the elemental composition of these ion spheres. And what you'll see here, you'll recognize the same elements. Fe, of course, is iron. For those of you who know the periodic table, Ti is titanium, calcium, potassium, sulfur, silicon, aluminum, magnesium, and another iron line here, actually. And you'll see from the commercial line, you'll see the same elements. Uh, iron, that's another iron line, calcium, potassium, silicon, and aluminum, and magnesium. There's a little sodium here. And, but don't bother about the small thing. This titanium is probably for some paint. Uh, but just a little comment on the sulfur peak here, which you see from, from the World Trade Center dust, be because this is absent in, from the commercial thermite. This is gypsum, plaster of Paris, a, a wallboard, gypsum player of the desk, wallboard for the American speaking species. And wallboard is a wonderful material, building material, also because it's protective for firing. The formula for the chemical constitution of wallboard of gypsum is calcium sulfate. And this was completely pulverized. The, the core columns of the towers were simply packed in wallboard for t fire protection purposes. But it was completely crunched in the destruction, in the process of destruction. So this is what you see here is a surface contamination of calcium sulfate on the surface of the ion spheres from World Trade Center. So no surprise. But nevertheless, the rest of it is, is unambiguous finger, finger proof that the, that the ion spheres, and please notice that they contain aluminum. So this is, this is and also silicon, which you also would you, you put into the thermite mixture. And, and uh, quartz to slow down the reaction. So this is, so the, but the, uh, the observation of aluminum both places tells where these iron spheres come from. They come from the thermite. And this is actually quite huge quantities. More than 5% of the dust consisted of, 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 of iron spheres. So if any of you down there, there are successful in isolating what a small black rim around the magnet, you are a witness. 
of something is wrong with the official story about World Trade Center. Yeah, give some responsibility. Now, this, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, actually, <laughs> the time frame for not reporting high treason in the United States is eight years. Okay, so you're a witness now. Now, there was this American professor called Stephen E. Jones. And when you have an explosion or an incendiary reaction, there's always something left. An explosion is never complete. You know that. Whenever there is an explosive event and the police come to investigate, they can always find remains of the explosive and identify the nature of the explosives being used. So even though we have seen here an unambiguous proof indication, and there are more, I have a list of 10 observations supporting this. Uh, but so the, the ion sphere is, is one, and it's enough. But Stephen Lee Jones asked himself, I wonder if we can find uh, unreacted thermite in the dust. Because uh, if there was thermite was used, maybe there would be something left. And he took a look, and yes, he found something uh, surprising. Because it was, this is not Hans Goldschmidt's old time thermite. These are some very tiny chips. And this is an optical micro photo of one of these chips. Actually, it's a biggie because this is about two millimeters long. It's very long. But they are red on, on one side and they're gray on the other side. So we call them red gray chips. And um, this is an electron microscope of one of these chips seen from the side, where here you have a scale bar, so you can, which is one tenth of a millimeter. So this is roughly the thickness of these chips. The white layer here is the red layer, because it's an electron microscope picture. And the, the, the gray layer is the gray layer. And this is, these are the dimensions of these chips. It takes a good microscope, actually, to locate them. They're, and it takes some skill with a good magnet actually to isolate and then come, they come up with, with a magnetic fraction. And after Stephen E. Jones published this on, on December 15th, 2007, uh, yours sincerely was, uh, was asked to join this team of, of scientists investigating these red grid ships. It eventually led to a, a publication on April 3rd, 2009, where I uh, ended up with serving as the first author. And uh, I'll show you just a, a few highlights of, uh, in, this, in this paper. 